live streaming our uh, Aldo Leopold, the Leopold Live series. Uh, with me is Dr. April Sampson. And again, we're glad you're here. wildlife experts, and of course, introducing our guest, uh, field expert, Mr. Chad Ellis. Thank you, Royal. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Kila Bamberger Ranch Preserve. We're really happy to have you here with us. We're very excited to be pulling out this tools. Um, and we're very excited to have a, pa have, uh, a panel of experts with us that are actually participating remotely. And we, we would like to thank them for being here with us today. They are Romy Swanson, Dr. Maureen Frank, Dr. John Tomachek, and Andy James. And I'd like to thank all of them for helping us field some of the questions that we're gonna have today and add to the experience of Leopold Live today. I also, I also have, have the, the immense, immense pleasure, pleasure of introducing, introducing our special guest today, today who's, who's Chad, Chad Ellis, who's, who's the, the Chief Executive, Executive Officer of the Texas, Texas Agricultural Land, Land Trust. Trust. And we're very we're excited, excited to have, to have Chad, Chad with us here today to talk to us a little bit more about the utility of cows, cows as a management tool. tool. So, so without, without further ado, you, Chad, Chad, take it away. Thanks so much, April. It's a pleasure to be here to to talk about one of my heroes, Aldo Leopold and his tools. Um, a quick overview of TALF. You know, TALF, the private landowners, to help them carry their legacy and heritage back down to the next generation. And more importantly, help foster that land stewardship and land stewardship ethic to the next generation. And it's key for us because we're wanting to keep working. Because it's beyond ranch. It's, it's, it's beyond the fence line of those uh, productivities, productivities and, and benefits uh, back, back to all of Texas. Our key goals at TOL, it's trying, to, trying keep, to keep these businesses, businesses viable, viable, right? right? And, and it, it talks, talks about, about the, the, the money. money. If we're, if we're sustainable, sustainable um, producing produce income, income from that, from that aspect, aspect and, and, and keep, keep the, the We think about, think about our ranch. Plants. They really, they really were, were developed and evolved, and evolved around prescribed fire, which we'll hear on Leopold Live, Live here in a couple of weeks. weeks. And, then, and then raising with it. And it is important for us to ecological processes, right? We think about with Dr. Lopez talking about succession. And with the cow is working with Forby aspect to a small grass, to perennial grass, to shrubs, to wood, woody species, we're managing that operation. We're also managing ecological princ uh, practi or principles in, in uh, water cycle, mineral cycle. And one of the important things we think about what we're managing, it's this right here, the, the, the leaf of the grass, right? It's more than just a leaf. This is a solar panel. It's capturing the energy from the sun and it's bringing that the system and this is a key component. When we look around, I, when I, I observe our, our landscape, I look solar panels across the energy cycle. The other aspect, we're capturing carbon in the air and bringing that back into the field. And that's, that's one of the key things is that when we talk about ecological problems, we solve them uh, not by practices, but by principles, right? So when we think about the five four, those are practices. and everything intact. When we think about eating a steak, what do we like? We like a medium rare, myself, a medium rare steak. That's, you know, around. 
around 160 degrees left and right. And we, we cook it to that 160 degrees. One's key point is to not lose the... Um, hey, Chad, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're having a little trouble with your mic, so we're just going to flip-flop real quick. And let me... Sorry, Phil. So when we're talking about the aspects of the principles of... There you go. Hey, yep. can you hear me? So with that... Uh, our second one is optimizing disturbance. And optimizing disturbance, we think about some of the soil health and croplands, we say minimize. We want to do no-till. But when we're talking about ecology and the grasslands, what we want to do is optimize, right? We're managing that succession. And so fire and grazing is, is one of those components of optimizing that disturbance. The third one is diversity. As we can see the landscape, we see great diversity. That diversity not only is benefit for pollinators and wildlife, Life, but it also feeds that, that underground herd underneath our feet of those microbes. And so it's key for us to have that. This, the fourth one is really keeping a living root year round. Just like you and I, I like to eat every day, as you can tell. So the same with those microbes. And our fifth is really integrating the livestock. So it's managing all these principles when we, we move forward. So those successful managers are beyond just cattle managers. They're actually beyond just a grass farmer. They're actually soil managers. When we get started on when we think about grazing, we really start with our inventory resources. First off, we want to know what the DNA of our landscape is, and that's our soil. Also, as they say, there's an app for that. So there's a soil web app that you can basically take your GPS unit and give you your soils where you're standing right underneath you. There's also a great uh, app, Land PKS, Land Potential Knowledge System app that tells you your soil. Also great for monitoring. We'll talk a little bit later. After we get our soil. here in just a second. There's three key components that I see that misused a lot within our grazing. And now the first one is the stocking rate. The second one is the stocking rate. And I imagine you can imagine what the third issue is, and that's the stocking rate. The stocking rate is a key aspect. It's really looking at the number of animal units on a given amount of land, right? So we utilize animal units uh, when we talk about grazing to a thousand pound cow calf unit. Again, Aldo talks about a cow, but it's, there's much more in the grazing. We can talk about sheep and goats and, and others. So what we do is we use that 1,000-pound animal unit to, to figure out our, our calculations. And lastly, we want to kind of know the carrying capacity. What is the supply? How much forage is out here on, on our operation? And we basically are trying to balance that demand, which is the stocking rate, to our supply to carrying capacity. When we think about the goals and objectives, I, I see too, we get in our mindset is, is important because we can uh, kind of prescribe our grazing to meet our goals and objectives. A lot of times what we have is we, we key on one species of uh, grass and that's what we focus on. And what we end up doing, it's great from a cattle management aspect, it, it provides um, it's easier management, it becomes uh, a, a lot more return on investment on that aspect. But if wildlife is truly one of our components, uh, we have to look at a different landscape. So I call that middle management is sort of that what we normally think about it. But this is a great you look here behind me is a messy landscape. A messy landscape is something we have to break that paradigm in our, our mind and not think about a, a manicured lawn, but think of that messy landscape for our wildlife and pollinators. So with that, we'll, we'll move on to visit with Steve, our, oper our manager here at Bamberger.
Well, with us again is Steve, the, the manager here at Bamboo, and it's great to uh, appreciate you letting me out here. This is, I mean, look at this. This is gorgeous. Well, I envy you. Every day you get to look at this. <laughs> thank you, and you, you are right. <laughs> it, is, it is definite benefit to the job. Yeah. Uh, and thank you again for coming out and sharing your expertise with with not only us, but all of our audience as well. Um, again, my name is Steve Fulton. I am the manager of the Van Burger Ranch Preserve. I believe you met me last week. Um, <laughs> Just a brief history of, of grazing uh, on the ranch. Um, the, the ranch has always had, had used that tool, that cow tool, uh, in our in our toolbox. We've always had grazing uh, on, on on Bamberger Ranch. At our, at our peak production, uh, we had about 220 uh, grazing animal units. Uh, that, that's combined with the cows and the, cim the herd of scimitar horned orcs that we also have that are grazing animals. And we also had about a hundred uh, animal units of browsing animals, i.e. goats, um, that helped us control those, those brush species. Now, a lot of big changes occurred here on the Bamberger Ranch in 2011 and 2012. Most people that, that live in Texas at the, were living in Texas at that time remember that time uh, not so happily. Um, we had a very severe drought, and like many other livestock operations, we severely downstocked uh, to the point where we removed all livestock from the Bamberger Ranch. And at that time, we relied more heavily on those other four, four tools that Leopold had, that we have in our toolbox that Leopold outlines. Uh, since then, we have returned cattle back to the ranch, but at a much lower stocking rate um, and not, not grazing the entire ranch. Yeah, I think that's a key point, Steve, is it's about flexibility is a key component of grazing. And having that kind of lighter to moderate stocking rate that you've, you've put in place gives you that flexibility. Certainly, and one of the rules that we had, we have always adhered to, or very strongly tried to adhere to, and we also advise and recommend for other landowners that have uh, have a livestock operation to adhere to, is that take half and leave half rule. Now, just to briefly go over that rule, we're talking about taking half and leaving half. We're talking about we're talking about the grass, the the, the the plants that are most most often utilized by your grazing animals. Now, looking at this grass plant. Uh, what we're seeing this time of year is a very tall grass plant, but that's not what we're going to see for most of the year. This 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 grass, this little blue stem, is is in the process of producing seed. This is the inflorescence, the the, the inflorescence, the cone, the inflorescence, the the seeding structures. Uh, so when we're talking about take half and leave half, what we're really talking about is the vegetative components. That is just the grass blades, not the not the seed stem. Um, so measuring that before you before you put your grazing animals in, uh, this is about 14 inches, and then monitoring those grazing animals through the through the through the, the grazing period that you have them in, in said pasture, and when it gets down to seven inches, six inches, you might want to think about moving those animals. Why 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 do we only want to take half? And, and, and not take not take it all the way down to the ground. Yeah, that's a great, great, great question, Steve. And when we're doing that, is if, if we look at it from a lots and lots of years of st of studies on this, is when we start uh, grazing below that fifty percent, as you as you mentioned very well in that key aspect, when we start getting 60, 70, 80 percent, we're actually stopping that root growth. Right? So that plan is actually, instead of being offensive, growing and taking the sunlight and the energy and other things that we talked about, it's actually going on defense. Right? It's going on a defense of, of just a survival mode. And when we keep going back and back, back to that same grass over time, we ended up killing that, 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 uh, that grass species. So it's really important for us to think about that. And, and with that, you lose your you lose your armor for that soil. You you lose your your uh, uh, ability for that plant to cycle those nutrients back into the soil. So your soil health starts to greatly diminish. And then also, just with the loss of that armor, erosion becomes an issue as well. Yeah, no, exactly right. You know, I think one of the things too, when we think about that half, right, is that um, we're not necessarily we're, part of that is going to be wildlife, right? You have a lot of wildlife and exotics and whitetail, they're part of the equation, right? And sometimes we overlook look that when we're making our calculations. We also have insects, and those cattle are going to trample some of that. So really, actually, when we think about it, of that 50% we're going to remove, really only 25% of that is actually going into the animal.
right, and for, uh, for into the cow. So we're really utilizing only 25% harvest efficiency is what we would call it. Uh, when, we're, when we're calculating that, so it's uh, it's a key a key key point. I think one of the other things that I appreciate you talking about is really the contingency plan that you had on the ranch, right? Uh, if you were prepared and had these triggers of when drought happened, we were going to destock and we were going to completely destock and we're going to let. Our, our ranch rest. And I think rest, if, if Leopold was still here today, I think he would throw the sixth tool, which is rest. And, and it's, a, it's a, I think one of those important tools that we kind of throw out and we overlook a lot of times. You know, it's the rest of providing fuel for the fire. It's, it's rest after a fire. It's, it's rest after those disturbances. Again, as you mentioned, that, that, that cycling and nutrient cycling and those things. You know, but lastly is when we think about putting all these things together we know our forage we know what we have we have we set our stocking rate when we look across there's a lots of different grazing systems out there and um, you know the, one of the main uh, grazing systems is continuous grazing so continuous grazing is we have one just fence with animals throughout had full roam around that whole operation or that whole pasture um, you know with that it takes some flexibility we can't move the, ca the cattle or grazing they're going to graze where they want to graze uh, but but there's some economic returns as there's less fence and inputs from that aspect another one of our uh, grazing systems is our deferred grazing so this is where we actually put some fence we give that time to operate from a rest perspective um, and, and it's a great another great tool I think it, it helps provide a little bit more flexibility and then lastly we have sort of a short duration grazing this is more fences more kind of inputs from that end but it also increases our flexibility and some of those and I would say one thing is that no matter what the grazing system is you have to find what works for you. I think, unfortunately, we think about these systems and we want to do that system and we don't think about the human dimension of ourselves, our skill sets, and the time that we have, right? And, and from that perspective. So maybe kind of share a little bit some of the grazing systems that you're... So what the, the grazing system that we've used um, for the entire, the entire time that we've had animals on the ranch has been the deferred grazing system. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's kind of, it's a, a middle of the road system yep. um, where you where you can you can you can have a, a maybe not a larger stocking rate but you but you can you can move those cattle around or those those goats you can move them from pasture to pasture and give that give that pasture a rest um, in, in a perfect world a short duration you know a high intensity short duration grazing system would work fabulous here and when right. you, you, you increase your stocking rate uh you get like you said it gives you more flexibility but at the same time it's that it's that cost and our one of our biggest obstacles to having that grazing system here is just our topography yeah i mean we we right. have between four and five hundred feet of elevation change in most of our pastures uh, uh, just so just running a fence even if it's a temporary fence is is a is a huge a huge hurdle um, also, um, with our, our pre-existing infrastructure, mainly our roads, uh, again, that, that fence is going to cross roads, and what do you do there? Uh, when we have our, our ecotourism that we have here on the ranch, uh, it's not, not conducive <laughs> to stopping and opening a lot of right. gates. Yeah, no, I, I understand that completely, right? It, 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 you have to find the right system that meets the goals of the whole operation, and you have those aspects. You know, I think I am, I, I do feel good that when we think about technology, we got, we got new technology coming out of um, actually collars and things that we can actually have a virtual fences and I, I think is a, a great opportunity to, to maybe you know in the future utilize some of that new technology there to help kind of you know increase I will say one thing is that take it and when you're moving those grazing systems take your time don't buy it off too much right you have a lot of in income as you mentioned on fences and water you know take a little bit as you go and, and, and learn it and work through it I'd say lastly is we don't know wh where we're going if we don't know where we are today. And that's a monitoring component of grazing. It's, it's um, uh, a key component and a lot of people overlook it. Maybe share a little bit of how you monitor. So in, in 2001, uh, we installed 14 grazing exclosures. Basically, it's just a, a, a three-foot tall cattle panel or two cattle panels that 
formed in a circle and put out in those pastures that we grazed. Um, and basically that, that is completely deferred from grazing. The animals can't get in there. You can kind of see what your impact is. You can really tell when you get that get, get to that take half, when, you know, get yep. that halfway point where you might need to th think about moving the, moving those animals soon. So it, 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 they have been a great tool. Yeah, no, I, I think they're a wonderful tool. What's, what's great about those tools, it's 25 bucks. You know, it's like 20, you know, 20 bucks for the panel, three feet posts. It's pretty simple um, and a great. I, I think also what I, I really appreciate about the, the grazing exposure is, you know, we, we are out there every day and, and we sort of overlook things, right? You, you kind of get complacent in what you're seeing. And those exposures tell you everything, what's happening. Especially when we get into situations of our, our rainfall scenarios, you actually can see how much forage you actually produced during that time. And uh, it, it starts really fine tuning your eyeball of knowing when to graze and when not to graze. I think one of the other components is rotation, when you were saying, is, is really rotating around what you see from the, the, the body condition for the animal as well as the landscape and the grass, grass right? I, I see, I've seen it happen too, too many, many times that we get stuck on a calendar and we have to move X day and we, do, and we overlook, right, the landscape and what's happening. We crash our cattle, we hurt our land. Well, if we wouldn't be so rigid, Right, uh, we could have we could have made a, uh, you know great improvements from that end. Exactly, and we, and we have that flexibility here for the most part. Now there are times yeah. when uh, hunting season is right around the corner, and uh, cattle mixed with deer feeders and hunters, <laughs> it's not a g really good mix. So there are certain dates of the year where the cattle have to be moved, but with some forward planning, that that is easily accomplished. Yeah. Now one other thing that our grazing disclosures have taught us is that without without uh, control by browsing animals, most of our exposures are grown up in brush. Fresh. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it shows you that succession. I think one thing is, a, you know, uh, something to suggest is that we don't keep those exposures in the same spot, right? We want to move them. It doesn't take much to move a 3 tee post to uh, the next season, yep. the grazing season, to help with that and, and uh, help get some grazing and browsing back into those so we don't see that, that woody species encroachment. So, you know, I think one of the other components is, uh, as I mentioned, the app, uh, the land PK is a great example of being able to, to put some monitoring information in there. Take photos. Uh, photos is a you know worth a thousand you know where you know aspects. I mean because you forget what happened two years ago and three years ago, and having that system that you can take uh, pictures and, and uh, go back and, and kind of see that succession, see those things, uh, and monitor. Really, what we're thinking about when we're working on grazing, it's it's uh, setting the stocking rate, it's monitoring, and it's adjusting, and it's a repeat, right? It's that flexibility. We don't want to keep a stocking rate set and keep it there. We want to adjust. Uh, with that, you know, with, with droughts and floods and, and wildfires and other things that may occur. I think one of the other components is the grazing stick you have there, Steve, is, is looking at those the these, uh, these heights, and we can measure the heights going in and the, the, the heights going out is a, is a great opportunity for us to utilize a tool simple as this. Yes. So. You want to give us a demonstration, Chad? The grazing stick, we can move in with four. Yeah, sure. So when we kind of start looking at uh, this this grazing stick, it's it's got a it's a little overwhelming in some sense. We got eat, we have um, you know equations to kind of figure out the amount of biomass. So we can basically take the percentage and lay out this grazing stick on the ground. Figure out how much for have uh, going down here but I think one of the best tools is really just looking at our, our heights so when we kind of look in here not it's where that medium part of our, our grass we're at 11 inch height, height aspect and so what we want to do is that again is think about that take half leave half principle as you mentioned Steve and so what we would want to do on this one is probably not graze any about five, five to six inches uh, on this particular piece, and we know we that uh, ocular estimate and kind of see if hey, it's it's time we, to to go on 
next pasture. The, the cattle will like it as well, right? They, it's just like all of us. It's a it's an opportunity for them to get some fresh uh, new new right. new groceries. And, uh, and one thing to also keep in mind when you're monitoring is some grasses are much more palatable than others. Yep. So the cattle are going to going to be be attracted to those highly palatable grasses, what we call ice cream plants. Um, so keep an eye on those, but also your your mid range pal as right. far as pal palatability. Um, but uh, the uh, those ice cream plants are the, 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 your first indications. Once once they get below that that take half, um, then you want one start, start looking at moving the, moving those animals. Oh, very great point. You know, I think too. Uh, just kind of ask you a little bit and, and talk through it. Is when we think about setting up. You know, for instance, we have a thousand acres. Right, and, and, and um, we're thinking and setting our stocking rate. We figure out what our forage is, how much forage we have out there. I mean, then we calculate it on that thousand acres, right? But when we look around here, you have, like you s said, topography, really rough terrain. We have some brush aspects, and really, we don't have a full thousand acres of grazing, no, right? Maybe half. Half. And so, kind of. Maybe walk through and tell us kind of how you kind of figure out your grazing, grazable acres to kind of figure out your calculations. So well, we take into account, um, you know, your cattle are going to going to really stick to those flat those flat parts of, of that pasture. I mean, we're yeah. in the hill country. We got hills. They're not they're going to graze very little on the hillsides. No, not not only because of the the steep condition, but also those plants that grow on those hillsides are not as palatable. You have a lot of muleys that, that hang out on those hillsides, and it's great to have them there because uh, they help with erosion. But uh, so it's, it's your bottom lands next to your riparian zones uh, in those adjacent areas, and then, then these hilltops here. Now, one thing you need to keep in mind is those riparian zones is it, the best, the best. Again, in a perfect world, we'd have those riparian zones fenced off where the, where the livestock couldn't get to them. Um, because those are those are all again very highly sensitive areas, uh, but they are also the areas where we have the greatest diversity. So taking all that into account, uh, you you basically you measure your hilltops. For for us, we me we measure our hilltops, and we measure those areas adjacent to the to our creeks in our riparian zones, and that's how we come up with our grazable acres per pasture. We we use a mapping software called ArcGIS to do that. Yeah, you know, I think one key component, Steve, when we're when we're thinking about grazing, and it can get overwhelming a little bit. And um, you know, there's a science behind all of this, but but more importantly, there's an art, and it's, it's actually going out there and doing it and observing and monitoring and adjusting and moving on. And I, I know uh, you've gained a lot over the years of just doing that. Yes, well, I've, I've had the pleasure of living here <laughs> for 17 years, so I've I've got lots of hours of observation. Yeah. Which is key. Yeah, that is. It's, uh, it's definitely important. Well, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for, for, for joining us today. That was, a, that was basically a brief overview. We're going to kick it back to April. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Dr. April Sansom, my executive director. Uh, take it away, April. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> and thank you very much, Chad, for that wonderful overview of not only the utility of grazing, but also how the Bamberger Ranch Preserve. So thank you very much. Thank you to the entire team uh, for putting this together. Um, I'd like to make sure that everybody knows that they are more than welcome to tune in to our additional uh, segments of Leopold Live. We are, just as an overview, we are focusing on the five
Do we have any questions? Okay, so talking about hoof stock, which is what we, when we talk about when we talk about uh, like as far as exotic species, um, oh, there's a plethora. Um, so you really what you want to concentrate on if you if you're replacing cattle as far as grazing you get you want to concentrate on those animals that are grazers um, we have scimitar horned oryx here um, also another another fairly common grazing animal an exotic animal is the is the black buck um, another we have a we have one neighbor that uh, actually actually owns some wildebeest um, so again just just looking Whichever animal that w fits fits what you, what your goal is and, and fits as far as management and what you can handle, and then again go back to those stocking rates. Uh, a thousand pound of of grazing animal is one animal unit. So if you're talking about black buck, they're similar to goats as far as their stocking rates. So about five to seven black buck or or the females as well. Five to seven of those animals will be one animal unit. Yeah, I think that's a key component, Steve. And I think another one is to, when we start thinking about exotics, is and you mentioned it, is understanding what they eat. Because we have a lot of those exotics that are intermediate type of uh, grazers, right? They eat uh, forbs, grass, and a little bit of browse, and understanding those components. And the key thing, again, it comes right back to that monitoring and, and the observation to make sure uh, you, your numbers are correct. Yeah, great question on our app use. So the ones that I, I utilize is the uh, Soil Web app is what it's called. And you can, uh, the Soil Web app is, is a great app. It's basically the uh, web soil survey within your, in, in your phone. And it takes a GPS, you can give you that readings of what soil. Uh, and then also you can dig a little bit deeper and uh, click a little bit deeper and that'll give you actually the ecological mm -hmm. site, right? So all of our soils, uh, it's sort of a DNA. It, it tells us what kind of mounts of different forage can grow on that particular soil. And uh, so it's a great app to kind of get that uh, kind of the beginning layer of when you're kind of talking about it. Another one I really like is the LAND PKS. And the, and the PKS stands for uh, Potential Knowledge System. Uh, my, my friends at ARS at Hornada uh, down in New Mexico developed this app. And it's a great app because it helps you, uh, it gives you the soils, it helps you kind of, it, it really walks you through everything you need to do. It also gives you the opportunity to how to do some monitoring and, and some of those. And you can, you can click it, put it in there, it saves it, and you have it stored. It has the photo option, uh, I think is a, a, another great one as well. There's also other software from when we think about the grazing management plan. 
dude out there. One is Pasture Map, uh, is a great uh, is a great tool um, here in the U.S. was developed here in the U.S. Uh, another one that I really like a lot is Lamaya Grazing, uh, based out of Australia, and I've worked with those guys a lot. Uh, it's it was ranchers developing tools for ranchers, uh, which is is always great from that aspect. So those are just a few, uh, you know, web web based or or app based tools that I like. Uh, now, I, I think I'm right with the web soil survey and the web app. That's through NRCS? NRCS. So it's taking the soil information from the Natural Resources Conservation Service and putting Yeah. Frequently. The other ones, I'm going to have to get on my phone. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we'll uh, just thank them. Again, I, I thank everybody for uh, joining us. And uh, thanks, Steve, for allowing me to, to spend the day out here. Uh, you may not get me out of the gate. <laughs> been my pleasure. I've learned a lot yeah. in just a few minutes you've been around. I hope to hope you hang around for the rest of the day. Yeah, it sounds you pick your brain. Uh, thank you again for uh, everybody tuned in and, and for our, our wonderful crew behind the cameras. So thank, thank you all.